It's hardcore history. Attention. So my apologies if um, today's show sounds a little like you're joining a conversation that's already in progress. But this has happened with me before where I'll be talking with someone about something, usually over a long period of time, you know, messaging back and forth or whatever it might be. And I'll think to myself, usually a little too late in the game, wow, you know, should have thought about making this a podcast. I mean, more people than just yours truly might want to hear what's being said here. And that's how today's show got started. Just an ongoing discussion that at a certain point um, you look at it and you go, hmm, well, I should have started recording a long time ago. But uh, So if it sounds like you're picking up the conversation in the middle of it, you might be. I've never been that good in the conversations or the interviews, as you probably know if you've heard me, of really like setting it up and starting at ground zero and building from a from a place of no knowledge and eventually getting somewhere in the conversation that's interesting. We just go right to the interesting. And uh, I hope we can all I hope it all makes sense without having all the background. But that's what today's program will be like. So I had a conversation that was ongoing about, of all things, um, military aircraft especially military aircraft in the Second World War. At times it got very specific, you know, the P-38, American fighter plane in the Second World War. Um, But I was having a discussion with Elon Musk, and um, we were talking about uh, the role of engineers in warfare. And that's a famous history, right? Go back to Archimedes, supposedly killed by the Roman soldier when he's doodling in the sand and he didn't want to be interrupted, and he made all those supposedly, I think, Mythbusters well, in their own way, figured out that some of this stuff probably wouldn't work. But, you know, they're not Archimedes either. Uh, but, you know, the history of warfare with these engineers creating weapons. And, of course, in the modern world, those people are monumentally more important than they were in primitive times. Although somebody invented a bow and arrow someday, the early military engineers. Um, but Mr. Musk and I were talking about this. And at a certain point, I thought, OK, this is a pretty good thing to just have a podcast about. Now, my worry was that we were going to get into the minutia of, like, turbo supercharged engines and the performance of different aircraft at different altitudes based on the octane rating in the fuel. And I'm not saying we didn't do any of that. I'm just saying it turned out to be more interesting than I thought it was going to be when we did get there. I want to issue a little disclaimer at the outset I am the worst person in the world to talk to about engineering. If there's any sort of engineering knowledge required in the conversation on my end, I'm a guy that can't, you know, hammer a nail into a board, so I'm an idiot. So um, if I don't look like I know what I'm doing here, well, you know, not only that, but if you wanted to say which of the three branches of service in the 20th century military, you know, land, sea, and air, that I was least confident Uh, that I wouldn't look like an idiot talking about. It would be aircraft. So we're just going to hold on and see if we can keep up with a guy who loves this stuff and understands it at a level I'll never be able to um, appreciate. And just in case his own knowledge wasn't enough, he brought in uh, one of the best engineers at SpaceX, Mr. Bill Riley, to come in and back him up on this stuff. So um, one way or another, we should get this stuff right, I would think, with the three of us. In any case, um... I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Elon Musk talking about, well, I guess it started off with him saying that engineers don't get enough credit in um, warfare. And, well, you know, we'll touch upon a little high-octane fuel and turbo-supercharged engines along the way. Without further ado, Elon Musk and Mr. Bill Riley from SpaceX. So what I thought was, I'll give the background about how the hell this even, you know, got started in terms of our conversation. And then what I thought maybe we could start off with, you know, you had talked a lot about how this was an engineer's war. And I thought to myself that the Second World War, of course, was not the first engineer's war. You can go back into history and you can find these moments, the famous, uh, the Romans inventing the Corvu device to help them win the naval war in the first Punic Wars, all those kind of things. But those are so rare because of the pace of technological change being so much more slow. And then you get to something like the Franco-Prussian War, maybe, but certainly in the First World War, where aircraft development becomes a race. And that if you develop the next new thing, you might control the skies for the next four or five months until the other side catches up. So maybe you could tell me a little bit about this whole engineer's war kind of concept. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So for a lot of books on strategy on war actually 
don't address technology or address it in a tangential manner. But obviously, if there is an overwhelming technology advantage, that side will win. Even if the odds are dramatically stacked uh, against them from a numerical standpoint, or the, the, they are, the, even if the other side has better generalship and is, is very smart, if there is a big technology discontinuity, then the, the side with the, the advanced technology will win. And as you, as you alluded to, most battles in history, because t- technology moved very slowly, uh, it was more about maneuvering and about tactics and strategy and, and whatnot. But uh, to use sort of an extreme example, if, for example, you can shoot lasers from space <laughs> to, at, 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 to any point on the ground, by just by like pointing at it, um, it, it would not matter if you were fighting Julius Caesar, uh, you know, uh, Heinz Guderian, Napoleon, they just got lasered from space. <laughs> so there's no, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, you know, when there's a technology discontinuity, it, it, that just fundamentally flips, flips the whole situation. And in the, in the wars in the modern era, we were, we're, we're very much a technology race war. Like they were just, how fast can we uh, uh, innovate the technology? The, I mean, obviously an, an, ex, an extremely good example of that would be, uh, perhaps the best example would be uh, the nuclear bomb. If you if you got if any, anyone who got nuclear bombs, that you now win. <laughs> That's it. Over uh, end of story. And the reason for the U.S. Manhattan Project, which uh, I'd like to emphasize, was very much a function of the, uh, the the physics community more than it was the government. People think that like this was a government thing. The government certainly supported it, but it was a decision by the physics community without which this, it certainly would not have happened. And, and, and the, the physics community simply came to the conclusion that we cannot have, let, let Hitler have the bomb, obviously, and so we must make it first and be certain of it. So the, the, but that's, that's an example of like, okay, you've just got uh, some super weapon that and anyone who gets it wins. Uh, no, no better example than uh, nuclear weapons. So... But, but I think these t- technologies has played a, a much stronger role in a war than is generally um, understood. And technology is to be viewed in, in the broadest sense. You could, th- you could also think of it in the sense of, say, do you have a, a better phalanx? Do you have uh, spears that are bronze or iron or steel? That's a big difference. Now, one of the things that the Romans had were... Um, they had actually quite good metallurgy. So they, they had their swords. I mean, there's two general, general phases uh, in steel, uh, uh, Orsonite and Martensite. They, their swords were more Martensitic. Uh, and so they had swords that did not bend as much. And so they're some, they often be fighting others who had swords that were much more ductile um, and basically bend over a Roman sword. <laughs> so obviously if you got if you have in a sword fight and your sword just bends like like a noodle, it doesn't work as well after that. So the Romans actually, I think, won their wars through technology. Uh, obviously, the internal wars they they, they were more uh, you know equal technology footing. But when 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 fighting outside uh, the Roman Empire, they would win their wars or sometimes lose their wars for technology. Uh, so when the Romans fought the the Scythians or Scythians, the the, they really did not have a good counter to the mounted war archer. And especially if they get lured into terrain that is flat and easy to, to maneuver for uh, horses, then uh, they're, they're, they're pretty much hopeless against uh, the technology of a, a mounted war archer, a, 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 a mounted archer. You know, and, and Genghis Khan took full advantage of the, of the whole mounted archer thing, obviously, as like most people who study anything about this now. But looking at, say... Um, the World War II and, and fighter plane advancement, bomber advancement, it's, it's perhaps uh, interesting to go into kind of how things started out and then how fast things innovated uh, and, and the, 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 the technology war of uh, specifically going into the um, fighters and, and some degree bombers of World War II. And uh, I'd like to say that you know, I think there's there was very impressive design work around fighters done by many countries. Um, so Japan, US, Germany, 
uh, UK, uh, Russia, and, and, and others ha- had some very impressive fighter designs. And then, and then the US obviously completely crushed it on the bomber front. So, but, but things didn't quite start out that way. At the beginning of World War II, when there would be fights between, say, in the Pacific Theater, between a U.S. aircraft and Japanese aircraft, there would at sometimes be cases. There would be cases where the entire U.S. squadron was shot down with zero losses on the Japanese side. <laughs> Just you know, total KO. And because uh, the U.S. fighters really at the beginning of World War II were were not very good, um, and nor were the tactics. And nor was the training. <laughs> so it's basically uh, the tactics are terrible, the aircraft are terrible, and uh, and the, the training is not, not correct. Well, wait, you bring up something interesting, though, because, I mean, you brought up lasers earlier, and I think we can all agree that if you go to some primitive planet where everyone's in caveman-type times and you have lasers, it's game over. Yeah. But there's but there are smaller levels of technological discrepancy, right? Bronze weapons versus iron weapons or or the latest aircraft versus the aircraft from five minutes ago, right? Or you mentioned a second ago tactics. Well, uh, you know, one of the things that— you know, there's so much that you learn when you first start learning about the, the world wars, for example. And then as you delve farther into it, you learn many of the of the more intricate things like tactics. So, for example, how American fighter pilots would have tactics to try to overcome the fact that they're flying inferior machines. Right. Um, um, uh, the thatch weave and all these sorts of things where they try to take advantage of. Yeah, the thatch weave is a, is, a, is a great example. Yeah, exactly. Um, the. The, the that tree is, 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 was a great example of improvement in tactics. Um, if you've got, if you're fighting a number, um, this is, was developed in, in, the, in the U.S. in response to the Japanese fighters, which were very uh, uh, agile, nimble, very nimble, yeah, nimble. And so, if you're fighting, if, if you're, you're if you're in a thing that's sort of more, more like a tank, and you're fighting something which is, you know, extremely nimble, but but you, you're not nimble, but you've got better armor than the the, the you basically want to just let the, the the nimble fighter get on your tail, and then let your squad squadron mate come back and uh, come behind you, and 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 shoot that plane down while it's trying to shoot you down. But it takes a long time to shoot you down because you've got a lot of armor. So so that's like a <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell the fast weave, and you just could do that back and forth. Uh, it, it, it's um, it, it made a big difference. Well, and you also have the th- stuff that always drives me crazy and that I was always so worried you were going to take me into this territory when we talked and I was going to look like an idiot. But, but, I mean, for example, things like uh, super turbochargers and being able to take the enemy to altitudes yes. where your plane's better than their plane. I mean, the That's intricacies and all this stuff. Yeah, okay, so, so, so let me ask you this then because we were just talking about um, choices in war and if you have the laser beam and the other guy doesn't, they're through. But, I mean, one of the things, and, and it's funny that I could be... Uh, history major and all these things for years, but it took a video game to make me really think about some of the production trade-offs, right? The stuff that's not so that's not so sexy for a war gamer. Things like, is it better or where's the sweet spot to build a lot of one design where you already have the production line geared up to build Sherman tanks or T-34 tanks, or is it better to, to build uh, a much smaller amount of much more sophisticated things? So Hitler making multiple choices on jet fighters and jet bombs bombers or maybe would you rather have 20,000 T34s or 1100 Tiger 2s how does one how does one if, if if i put you in charge if i said elon come in here in second world war help us make these trade off decisions um do you have any thoughts on those kinds of trade offs well i think it's going to be kind of like in a war game you know so if you've got let, let, let's say you have something with a particular kill ratio let's say if, if your kill ratio is 3 and the thing costs twice as much then you should still do that thing because you're going to be better off. You got it. You it only costs twice as much, but it has a three to one kill ratio. So, what about something like then 
um, adjustments. So like when I think of, um, you know, one of the things they used to teach us in, in the military history classes was that if you're facing another opponent, the, the side that has the technological advantage is at its greatest um, disparity at the very beginning of the conflict. And that is the longer the conflict goes on, the more time the adversary has to adjust and come up with countermeasures. So that's how tribal peoples in Afghanistan maybe adjust to being the technologically inferior side. Um, could one make a case today that there are examples of that? You know, the U U.S. still, I would, I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong, the technological leader there in military technology. But if you're uh, the Russians or the Chinese and we end up in a war in 20 years, are there ways that they can compensate for the fact that they're behind on certain? I mean, is an electromagnetic pulse attack something that helps compensate for a satellite uh, discrepancy? Um. I know we're jumping around here. That's how I'm sorry. So, you know, jump around. <laughs> um, I, I do think if I could jump in, though, I think there's yeah. there's an interesting thing here, too, which is your rate of innovation might yes, be the exactly. key after the first opening salvos. Because if you're able to innovate faster, you can make up ground. For example, you know, the first Mustangs had the Allison engines and they weren't good at altitude, but you put a Rolls Royce turbo supercharged and then you get a really good all around fighter. So it, yeah. it might be that the rate of innovation and ability to adapt to like the, the basically the game of rock, paper, scissors that Elon and I yes, often talk exactly. about. Like when there's a better scissors out there, you need a better rock or the butter battle book by Dr. Seuss. But you know, you're always <laughs> chasing the next widget. Rate of innovation is the key. Um, OK, so what about the reverse engineering aspect then? So famously, one of the stories from the Second World War is the U.S. getting their hands on a, a relatively intact Zero fighter. I think it was in the Aleutian Islands and being able to take that apart and maybe maybe gain six months of time that they wouldn't have had before in, in the development phase. Um, uh, any thoughts on those kinds of things, the ability to, to, to maybe uh, learn from your adversary? Yeah, um, I, I, if, I, if we sort of put ourselves in the position of like, hey, we're, it's our job to design advanced fighters, for sure we'd love to see, uh, you know, get, say, an enemy fighter or even allied fighter and take it apart and take a look at the, the, the small engineering decisions that we, we think would be in interesting. What, what materials they use, what joining methods, like, you know, if it's a reciprocating engine, how, you know, you know what, what uh, pressure were they running the uh, cylinders at, uh, what, what are they using for O-rings, it's a ton of things like that. But, for example, something like just like material properties that you can count on make a big difference. So if, if you're using, say, a high-strength uh, aluminum uh, sheet for a stress skin wing, you, you may have material properties, depending on how that alloy is made, that could be, that, that could be variable. And then that, that forces you to use the, the lower end of what that variable strength might be. Um, and thus make the skins thicker, thus make the plane heavier, and then you've got a knock-on effect where if, if, if the wings are heavier now, the landing gear needs to be heavier, engine needs to be more powerful, you get this recursive effect of mass. So on the other hand, if you can count on very tight material specs, now you can, you can design the, the plane to use uh, thinner w wing skins. Because you don't have to account for the fact that maybe this, this batch of aluminum was, was not that good. Think, things like that actually make a big deal, are, are, a, are a big deal. In World War II, with the fighter situation, a, a big factor was what, what octane rating could you count on uh, for, the, for the, the, the engine? The fuel, yeah. It's a huge <laughs> the deal. Americans had the high octane stuff. Yeah, really. Um, so if, if, if you, you know, you're going to like that Adam II's book we were talking about, because one of the things that he focused on that I'd never heard about in terms of Second World War importance was he was talking about the rare materials, the tungsten type stuff and all the all the sorts of things I couldn't tell you five little things about. And they were talking about what a huge deal it was for. I mean, the Germans would invent this wonderful new weapon, like a something like a cone bore gun, for example, but required tungsten to make it work. So the scientists have created this wonderful new weapon, but the, the the state does not have the the ability to get the basic materials you need to have that weapon work. And a huge part of the whole war thing was who has the the rare materials and where do you get them from and how do you how do you jury rig it when you don't have it you know domestically? Um, that's fascinating stuff. You, that's right up your alley. Yeah, absolutely. Germany and and I think Japan as well were really operating from, from a position of, of really not having good access to access to um, uh, high quality fuel and limited access to uh, rare materials. But I think it's, it's not so much the rare materials that, that, that matters. It's just like 
if you if you need <laughs> you know that the, the you really want want a plane's body and frame is going to be primarily aluminum and the, a simple thing like can you count on on what what's your what, what's your what are your a basis material allowables b basis you know, basically do you have to make a temp, the skin ten percent thicker to account for variability in the quality of the aluminum or aluminium as it should be called uh, that's gonna make <laughs> if your plane is now ten percent heavier at a structural level because of, of uh, strength variation in the in the aluminum that you've been sent, then uh, that will actually have a knock-on effect on everything else. The, the recursive effect, of, sure, speed, maneuverability, everything. Yeah, but right? it, it, the, the, there's a recursive effect of mass. So it's a if, mass if, begets mass, as we say, right? Yes, mass begets mass. So you know, if your primary structure is ten percent heavier because you had to take a ten percent knockdown because of variable materials. Now everything's going to have to be uh, uh, heavier too. You need a, a more powerful engine to, to go at the same speed, and especially to climb at the same speed. You need bigger landing gear. You need more fuel uh, because uh, you're carrying a heavier plane. All, all these things amplify the mass of any one. Uh, so you, you increase mass you, you, uh, in, in one area, it, it actually causes the mass of everything else to increase as well. And... Um, uh, uh, Germany actually did a, a ton of clever things to try to improve the that the uh, the octane rating of, of fuel, like tons of additives and all sorts of things, because they would they, they would just get random tra fuel that was pretty bad, whereas uh, the U.S. had awesome fuel, <laughs> and so they really took took it to the you know, very, very high octane. And um, as Bill was saying, the the Merlin engine, and and really the the, the best Merlin engine was the one made in the U.S. <laughs> that, that was the Turbo supercharged Merlin made in the US for the P51 was such a kick ass engine, it's insane. I mean, and quite frankly, that's the kind of thing where uh, I'm, I'm sure that the Germans captured uh, some aircraft that had um, the this, this sort of state of the art, you know, a P51D, uh, you know. Uh, the, the, that would have been late war, though, 44 45. Yeah, yeah, but but it, it like it, that's a case where you could you could hand it to them and the blueprints, and it wouldn't matter because that engine is is is, so, is is actually so difficult to make that it's irrelevant. <laughs> so, Isn't that a British? Is that a British engine originally? Yes, it's, it's it's originally a British engine, which was then uh, en enhanced uh, uh, in the U.S. Okay, okay, um, and, and so um, so the actual so, best one, the, the best one was uh, the the the. In, in my opinion, and maybe different opinions out there, but the best one was the 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 British Merlin engine design, and but but then further enhanced uh, uh, with the uh, U.S. Uh, turbo supercharging, um, which which led to a the the, the Mustang being this, this incredible long range high high altitude fighter, and uh, but but you, you you couldn't if you got low octane fuel in that engine you'd have a real problem. So Okay, but let me talk about that, because this is something most people, yours truly included, don't understand. And you might have to use small words with me, Elon, for a minute. So, But, but, but like, if, if Dan Carlin looks at the aircraft performance, I'm going to look at the, 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 the firepower. I'm going to look at the armor. I'm going to look at the turn radius. I'm going to look at the top speed. I'm going to look at the climb rate. And I'm not going to look at the octane level. But the Americans had the extreme octane fuel, which it, I was reading that as the war went on and the, and the, and the Axis fuel got worse and worse yeah. quality, that this advantage became more and more pronounced. What does it mean to have higher octane fuel if you're a pilot? What can you do that the guy with the lower octane fuel sure. can't? So if you, if, if you have the lower octane fuel, you, you get pre-combustion. So basically you get knocking. So uh, it reminds me of the old gasoline yeah. commercials, the knocking and the pinging. Yeah, exactly. It, it, the, 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 the air fuel mixture ignites before you're ready for it and in a non-optimal way that robs power and can lead to mechanical failure essentially. Okay, so so is your so if you're the if you're the other pilot with the lower octane fuel besides the knocking and the pinning, pinging and the lower power does that mean you lose you know, so if conceivably your plane should be able to go 400 miles per hour but you're using inferior fuel does that lower your top speed? I'm trying to figure out how it works for the pilots involved when they're trying to make their calculations. Yeah, you would see it show up as power and then your power as you go to different altitudes. Yeah, and then you you can't. So what's the role of the what's the role of the supercharger then? Is that a high altitude, low oxygen thing? Um, yes, uh, the 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 turbochargers or superchargers are, are are increasing the 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 combustion 
pressure. So, uh, like basically, in, in enabling, you're 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 basically if you, if you go up high, you're 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 the air's very thin. So if you're just taking air with a normal carburetor, you're you're going to be oxy oxygen stopped, just as, as a human is oxygen stopped. So you've got to pressurize that air coming in and feed the engine very high pressure air so that it can it can uh, continue to produce high power at altitude. And you're also going to have a major cooling problem. Uh, <laughs> that's the why you know, the Mustang had that that gigantic uh, cooling thing under uh, under the fuselage, which is then also made dual use of as kind of like a jet. It has a slight jet effect. There's a name for it, I forget. But um, even though it looks the Mer like it's Meredith got, effect, Meredith effect, exactly. So it, it offset the drag of the gigantic radiator, basically. <laughs> that's um, that was under the fuselage of the P P51, but but frankly, if if the octane is 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 not high enough, you you will get mechanical damage to the engine, and the plane will break. You know, so the, the engine will fail. So it's not just a hey, it's not as good. It's like uh, also it might conk out on you while you're over the Pacific or over you know uh, enemy territory, and that will be not great. So octane is a super big deal. This is this reminds me of another conversation you and I had, and it's made me think ever since. And it had to do with uh, with uh, the plane. I think is one of your favorites, the P thirty eight Lightning. And 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 this is another this is another problem that happens to you when you study this like I do, as opposed to flying these planes like other people do. Which is, you had said to me, having the two engines would be really important if you lost one of them. And I remember thinking oh, that in a for sure. <laughs> yeah, but but I mean that's not the kind of thing when you're thinking about this in a war gaming sense or an overall strategic sense. You're not thinking about an individual pilot or whatnot. But that was that was a revelation for me. Um, so so for those who don't know, the P thirty eight is the one that looks like it's two planes sort of fused together. Uh, it's a classic American design. We ended up making what the P sixty ones like that too. I think. Um, tell me a little about that plane because you 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 waxed eloquently on that for a while to me before. Um, came out in like what thirty eight thirty nine the design. Yeah, it, it didn't really get good until a couple of years later, and and I think they actually could have take, taken the the P thirty eight Lightning much further than they did. Like if you put, for example, state of the art uh, Merlin engines, uh, like like the P fifty one got, like the um, Mustang got, man, that would be an epic plane, insane. Uh, but yeah, P thirty eight was. It's worth noting, like I believe. Um, most of, most of the top American aces, if not all, were, uh, flew P thirty eights. And um, now the P thirty eight is 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 not like it was as designed. It was not great in any theater for it was, but it was great in the Pacific theater. But it was ultimately superseded by the F six F Hellcat, which, which you know this is like an interesting bit of trivia. If you say what was the most effective fighter plane in World War Two. And the actual answer is the Hellcat, because what was the criteria you used for that? The the the, the, the kill ratio. So, okay, okay. Well, that has a, there's a lot of other variables though that go into yeah, that. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> if you're in a battle, that's the what that's the thing that matters. So. Uh, yeah, but what about, but you got pilot skill. We just talked about octane fuel. There's uh, tactics. There's, I mean, I can think of a lot of things that might go into what what accounts for a kill ratio besides just the, I mean, would you rather have a, a, a Hellcat than a, a Corsair or a Mustang? Uh, well, you couldn't really have a Mustang unless you've got a, a Mustang is a, a, not a carrier aircraft. It's a land-based plane. It's a, it's a, no, it's a land-based yeah, plane. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, it's important to note, like if you're if on, on a carrier, you're constrained uh, uh, in volume, um, like you, you, you can't have like a giant plane or your plane with some limitations on plane size. You got to fold the wing, so you're going to lose. You're going to have some right. uh, weight added because you got a folding wing. The, the the stall speed has to be super low so that you can land this thing on a, on a very tiny runway that's in the wind. It's a carrier, like that's not long. So as soon as you say you've got to have to have a, a, a slow stall speed or slow landing speed. That also impedes the design of the vehicle, but really, I mean, for for its day, uh, there was no better plane in the Pacific Theater than the F six X, the Hellcat. It was just crushingly good. Like it, it, it was, 
it did the best at the rock, paper, scissors situation. And I believe had uh, something like a 13 to one kill ratio. So that's, that, that's a nutty number. It's just nutty. And this is, this is uh, pilot skill uh, is, is, is not, I would say there was not a significant factor in this because most of the pilots of, of those planes had never been in combat or had been in combat to a very, very limited degree. The Hellcat was actually intentionally designed so that someone who had a small number of flight hours would be able to fly it safely. Because um, besides being shut down by an enemy aircraft, there's also a landing on the carrier and not crashing. <laughs> which is yeah. <laughs> it's a subtle, <laughs> subtle point, yes. Yeah. These things don't land themselves. Um, so, so Elon, wait a minute. So you talked now a couple of times about the rock, paper, scissors dynamic when it comes yeah. to aircraft. Now, in naval development, that's easy. We say speed, armor, gunfire. What does the rock, paper, scissors uh, uh, apply to in air combat or air development? Sure. Um, and both, if, if, please, wait and wait, whatever you'd like. Um, but, you know, it, it's, if you take civic theater, for, civic theater for a while, you have the, uh, the zero, which is really an awesome design, extremely agile. And uh, you know, really cool in a lot of ways. Light, light, and re really, really effective. And like I said, in in the early air battles in the Pacific, the 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 zero would absolutely dominate. The two are and they had they had better pilots in the early war too, though that does come into play, doesn't it? Those are veteran pilots flying those zeros. Um, no, I, well, well, flying in China, flying you know all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the, but I, th I think the, 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 I mean, U.S. started off with uh, the kind of the, the worst planes, the worst tactics, and the worst training. <laughs> That's true. That's, I'm not going to argue with that. No, I'm not going to argue with um, that. <laughs> pretty, pretty bad, really. I mean, it, it's, it's rough seeing some of those early battles where, man, those kids never stood a chance. No. So the, you know, the, the Zero was for sure the superior thing in the beginning to the uh, U.S. fighters. Uh, uh, so, but very, very quickly, uh, the U.S. evolved the training, uh, the tactics, like, and the technology. And then the, the thing is like, okay, so if the U.S. starts off with paper and the, and say Japan has scissors, <laughs> what, what's a rock <laughs> in this case? So the rock in this case really was the, the, the best rock. Uh, and this is just you know, looking at actual battle stats, uh, was the carrier-based F6F Hellcat. Now, this is not a pretty plane. And the reason there, <laughs> there are not, there are very few of these around is because it's it's not the best looking aircraft, frankly. They're bulky, aren't they? They're kind of bulky. <laughs> like P-47s are bulky. The Brewster Buffalo was bulky. It's bulky and, and frankly, not not a handsome plane. So it's a lot of armor blocky and, and kind of cool, but this is blocky and not like didn't look that good. But it it's a kick-ass uh, fighter. It's the it, it's it is then the rock to the the scissors that is the zero. And so with with the F six F really great sign. It's literally designed like with the intent of we're, we're going to have a whole bunch of new pilots who've never been in combat, never been in combat, have had the, have landed very few times on a carrier, and and you know. Some of them are just not that good. There's not that good at, at, at flying, really. So uh, they just got conscripted, and they were like, you know, riding a tractor in Kansas until not that long ago. So it was designed with that in mind. It's like it's like let's make this thing easy to fly, easy to land, so non non combat casualties low, uh, easy to maintain, uh, make the, the the wings easy to fold, so you can you know uh, stow them really real fast and and get them ready for flight real fast. We're going to give them heavy guns. So we've got 50 cals, and we're going to give this thing a lot of armor. Okay, so it's got a lot. It's, it's got a lot of armor. It's got a lot of power. And this is a big. This is actually quite a big plane. So it's, you, know, <laughs> you see the size of this thing. It's it's looks like a bull. Um, I think almost four times the power of the zero. Right. So big, big, big ass engine, and, and just re really robust to fire. Air, especially to uh, lower caliber bullets. So if it's being shot with like 303s or something like that, lower caliber bullets, it, 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 it's like basically like taking a shower. It doesn't care, you know? Did they have so, self-sealing tanks and all that kind of stuff too? The Japanese exactly. were not big on. Yeah, okay. Totally. So, so you get 
you get fuel tanks to seal themselves. It was it was very carefully armored. So it had like heavy duty armor in, in the right places. And so what would happen is uh, Zero would get on the bat, uh, on the tail of a uh, of a Hellcat and would just be peppering the thing like guns blazing, pressing the fire button. It's going and that's this thing is just not coming down. Okay, <laughs> so it didn't matter that the Hellcat was not that maneuverable. <laughs> So, you know and, what, though? You're, ma- you're making me think of a whole different class of planes, though, and I hope you don't mind me shifting here because now you've got me thinking about, um, for you know, one of the planes I was always kind of interested in was, was something like, you know, Henschel was making a ground attack aircraft. They had a 126 and a 129, and they were a combination of super heavily armored planes, really not very maneuverable, not very fast because they were, they were flying tanks, and then a gun that was more suited to a tank, too, and trying to figure out, you know, how you handle a massive recoil of a heavy gun in an aircraft and whatnot. Um, any thoughts or any insights into, into something like the, the ground attack aircraft? Because these days, we would look at aircraft as being, uh, and, and all during the Cold War, the idea of how the U.S. was going to compensate for this massive armored thrust through the Fulda Gap in Central Europe or something was going to be with aircraft that just took out all these tanks, which, of course, is really a Second World War development. Any thoughts on the idea of ground attack aircraft? Yeah. Um, so, if you, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's, just think of these things as very much rock, paper, scissors. And, you know, it's, it's hard to be a master of all trades. So, so you really want to have like the right aircraft for the right use, and ground ground attack aircraft uh, you really need to be heavily armored on the bottom and around the engine cowling because that's where the bullets are coming from. And, and you want to be probably pretty pretty fast. Uh, you don't want to be staying down on the deck for too long uh, if, if you're doing scraping runs. But like for example, the the P fifty one was an amazing high altitude fighter, but it was not so great as a ground attack aircraft because it was vulnerable from the bottom. The, the armor on the bottom was was much more limited, and it had the oil cooler, uh, uh, that, you know, that oil cooler we're just talking about that provided some thrust using the Meredith effect, uh, was uh, vulnerable from the bottom. So it, it, it was it was the, the Mustang was geared towards you know uh, your combat with with uh, fighter aircraft, and so it was was quite good in that respect, very good in that respect. But they had a lot of planes down because of ground attacks. Where they're basically at some point, there just weren't any more fighters to deal with, so the, the Mustangs would go down and, and do ground attack. But but they they got shot down quite a bit in ground attack because they were just they weren't well suited for that. You want something that's got a lot, like I said, a lot of heavy armor from the direction the bullets are coming, which is in the bottom, and and not not much, you don't want to have too much vulnerable stuff there. Assuming if you're doing strafing runs and if you're doing bombing, as a whole, that's a whole different subject. So. You know, I'm trying to think about the most the most impactful fighter war of all time, right? Because, you know, like you said, bombing's a different thing. But to me, I'm thinking of like when fighters and fighter development, not just in terms of the development of the planes themselves, but the tactics, the strategies and all this stuff. Can you think, I think the Battle of Britain's got to be the most impactful, mostly concerned with a fighter technology sort of thing. And you have Spitfires and Hurricanes on one side, you have uh, Focke Wolves and Messerschmitts on the other. Any thoughts on the Battle of Britain and the whole ebb and flow of the technological rock, paper, scissors game going on in that one? Uh, sure. Uh, so, yeah, the Britain mostly had like Spitfires and Hurricanes. And um, but now... The Spitfires and Hurricanes also went through very rapid evolution. So you say Spitfires, say which one? Literally, you can't one. Right, which very A, B, C, D, they all sound yeah, like that, exactly. right? They were rap- rapidly iterating versions of the Spitfire and Hurricanes so friggin' fast that uh, you, you have to like say uh, which month or maybe even which po- which week in which month uh, was that fighter built. So that, that you know, uh, Britain did actually an incredible job of rapidly evolving Spitfire and Hurricane. And uh, and actually, Germany, Germany did a great job too. Uh, um, the the Fock Wolf and Messerschmitt were were amazing, uh, but but they're they're really operating at a significant disadvantage uh, from a range standpoint. So the you know if, if you're doing these sort of like these maneuvers all over the place, where at you know just cranking full throttle, climbing and diving, using a lot of fuel when you do that, so the climbing part certainly, and. The German fighters were coming over from uh, airfields in, in, in France uh, or Netherlands, or basically not close, and so they, they would they would reach uh, London or something like that, and only have 
maybe 20 minutes of, of combat time. Whereas the British planes might have an hour of combat time and very quick to refuel and be back up in the air. So you can And if you get shot down, you're shot down over friendly territory. Yeah, you shot down over friendly territory. But but you can think of it like the if you have X number of fighters, but but then like here's an additional nuance is what percentage of the time can they be useful? And so even if you if you if you're attacking from far away and you have 20 minutes for argument's sake, 20 minutes of of uh, flight time, of, of, of fighter time, of combat time, and your the opposition has an hour of combat time. That's that's it's almost like having three times as many planes. Oh, interesting way to look at it. Yeah. So, and, and very easy for them to bring up reinforcements dynamically. So it's sort of like, oh, uh, let, let's let's because uh, you know if, 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 if being outnumbered is uh, a, a a great way to win. Like if you you know. If it's like six planes against, you know, 20 planes, the six planes are in trouble. They should run away. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very good. Just run away. <laughs> so it, it, it was obviously pretty easy to see that, okay, these how many planes are coming, where are they headed? And you had radar assistance and everything and and, and say, okay, let's let's have a let, let's concentrate the, the defense fighters in this in, you know, right right here and just and, and very very quickly fly up reinforcements. So I think the, the, the obviously the Battle of Britain was 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 not, was not a smart uh, move in, in any way um, on for you know for Germany to do that. That was it's just it's, it's just it was not going to work. So a German strategic decision making leaves something to be desired. Yes, for sure. Yes, I think the, I think I think their tactical abilities and their abilities in in scientific design and whatever uh, uh, sort of shielded them from the, the the mistakes that they made strategically to some degree. Speaking of that, I want to ask you, because one of the, my favorite sections in any book on the development of military aircraft is the interwar years, because you get a chance to see a whole bunch of designs that eventually turned into like dead end designs. And I'm fascinated by some of these experiments. You see it in the Soviet Union a ton, but even we were just mentioning the Battle of Britain, where they unleashed the the supposedly, you know, game changing Messerschmitt 110s. And it proves to be those those for those who don't know, this is a larger fighter. And the idea was it was going to use use firepower and size, but it turned out to just be total meat to the smaller, more nimble fighters that could get on their tail. Um, do you have any favorite of these dead end designs or something that you wish, you know, that had been stuck to a little bit longer and would have maybe in your mind made more of a difference? Um, maybe there is no dead end designs you like. Uh, <laughs> let's leave the, not, let's leave the door open to that possibility. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's an argument that uh, on the German side, they should have perhaps Focused on the Focke Wolf 190. It was a great plane. Yeah, great. Focke Wolf 190 was a really great plane, and just doubled down on that and and made that a primary plane. That was that was an excellent plane. They built a ton more uh, of the Messerschmitt 109 versions though than that. Ton more. Yeah, it didn't make total sense because the uh, 190 was in my in my opinion a the, the better way to go. But I mean, apart from the fact that the Battle of Britain was just a not not a wise a strategic decision. Uh, it, it, if you are going to do that, you should definitely have long, long range fighters that have good dwell, dwell capability and with drop tanks and that kind of thing. But it, it was just, it was just a pointless. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, it's just like such a, such an odd thing to do because strategically the battle burn just, I think had, had, uh, you know, not quite 0% chance of success, but pretty close. That's why strategy trumps tactics for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a Star Trek episode in mind that I want to involve you in. Um, if I take you back to one of these engineering rooms, whether it's in London or in Washington, we wouldn't be in Washington, probably be in Southern California, someplace like that. But take you to one of the Allied aircraft engineering rooms and just say, okay, Elon, you're working with whatever those people have to work with. What's the what's the easiest, quickest thing that you can suggest to them that they can do that will make a difference? In other words, you can't do anything too sophisticated. They can't get from here. To there but you could say something like well you know you guys are missing something really obvious here that you'll discover five years from now i mean is there anything right away that you look and you just go if they'd only done this sooner or something like that 
uh, well, nu- nuclear bombs. <laughs> well, well, but 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 a perfect, but that's a perfect example of what wouldn't work in this question because nobody would have known. But there might have been some. I didn't know if there was some little thing that they weren't doing with aircraft that they would do later that would have made a huge difference, bang for the buck wise. But now you get into nuclear weapons, so let's talk a little well, about that because I. I mean, we go, try, go ahead. We can, Sorry. Try, we can try to answer the uh, the um, both. Was there something simple? Yeah, something they were missing. You know, I never understood why they didn't replace the Sherman. It seemed like there was time to iterate <laughs> on that and come up with something better. Well, they did with the Pershing, but it was just really, really like last couple of months. Yeah, of the but it just—I don't know. It, I never, I never re- delved into this, but it seemed like the the Shermans just had a terrible time and and iterating on that faster. Where you maybe they had all the energy going to the fighters. I don't, I don't know. It just always seemed odd to me. Well, we were talking about this earlier. It was a little bit about the, is it worth retooling the production lines for a new uh, a new version, or would it be just better to just keep cranking out the old versions? And I, was, I remember somebody telling me, he says, yes, 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 yes. You'd rather have a Tiger II tank for sure, but if you've got 25 times as many Shermans, wouldn't you rather just have a tank sometimes versus no tank? And, and so I absolutely, I mean, as you know, as a guy who wargamed with the Americans forever, nothing makes you angrier than to sit there with a bunch of Sherman tanks and be picked off by by German gunnery before you can even see them. Um, but what but what one guy always said to me, he goes, well, but you've got to give yourself then 20 tanks for every one of theirs if you want to replicate what was going on in the war. And then you've got to have what Elon was talking about earlier, the ground attack aircraft and everything else. But, you know, what's crazy is that we ended up exporting those Sherman tanks, as you both probably know well, for many years. They upgraded them, um, for example, in Israel with a, with a better gun. And these things were still being used in the early um, in the wars in Israel. I, I don't know how many they were called Super okay. Shermans. I don't know how many they were using in the 60, in the late 60s, but these things were still rolling around, you know, come off the assembly lines in 43, and they're still using them 20 years later in some theaters. Okay, okay. that's, 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 I I wouldn't 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 be my recommendation. I I think pretty desperate to be using a Sherman 20 years later, but yeah, I I mean, if if, if I'm strategically against, um, you know, Tiger tanks or something like that in, in, in World War II, and I had Shermans, uh, my strategy would be to just run around in a circle, drive around in a circle until the Sherman, until until the the Tiger breaks down or runs out of fuel. <laughs> usually they just and usually Elon they just parked them in some wonderful zone and let them. But you know what? That's what art as my as my old friend used to say. That's what artillery is for. <laughs> yeah, no, they they they, they they're big. I mean, it was an incredible tank, uh, t- Tiger, but it used a lot of a uh, lot of fuel and. The reliability was, was it was heavy. It was heavy, heavy, it was, heavy. It was heavy, and the reliability was not great. Yeah, I think that, so, that that does show the yeah the complexity and the the like the lack of parts and interchangeability yeah. and the the diver- like they had so many different flavors that they couldn't service them and keep them running. So clearly the the single lots of the single tank has lots of advantages. Yeah, I would just honestly the, the small move just like just, just retreat and and, 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 and eventually that, t- that tiger is going to run out of fuel or break down. And then it's a sitting duck. I had a professor who said you can compare these things to the car manufacturers for the various countries involved. And they said that the, the, the Germans built fantastic tanks. And a lot of them were the same companies that build fantastic German cars. But they're really precision instruments. And they require a lot of maintenance. And you got to take care of them. And, you, and, and, and you know, the, the combat situations just don't allow for that. So, well, you'd much rather have a German tank than a Russian tank until they break down. And then you got to have the right spare yeah. parts and the right and the technicians. And then you'd rather have... Have something that's just more of a tin can that works on a couple of strings, you know? Well, I think you can have like pr- arguably the best of both worlds is, or, or most of the best of both worlds is, is possible. Um, it, but it, it, it certainly is not a good idea to have, you know, uh, 27 different, or for argument's sake, like di- different designs of, of, of a tank, uh, especially if, if you're on, yes. the, on the Eastern Front and a zillion miles from where the spare parts are. Uh, yes. This is, this exactly is really right. unwise because, um, you know, you, you can get stuck because of one, you know, you you blew a little valve in the engine, and now okay, now you're five five thousand miles from where the spare part is. <laughs> like, wait a second. And the allies are bombing your ball bearing plants and yes, all that sort of stuff absolutely. too. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, you you definitely want like field replaceable, field repairable situations. Uh, but it, it is you know in in terms of like uh, excellence in operation, it, it is um, if you look at uh, World War Two fighter races. On, on Wikipedia, 
and see how long you have to scroll before you find someone that isn't German. Have you, have you done that? Yes, but I would argue that there's other things going into it. So tell me what you think is going into that number. Um, okay. What accounts for that in your mind? Um, well, okay. So part, part of it is that the, uh, uh, in the beginning, the, the Russian planes were, were not very good. And so, uh, or the Polish the, planes or the French planes or, you know, keep going, right. The Czech planes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, there's a, there's a few cases where, um, uh, German pilots were fighting battle of Britain, um, and would have like, you know, um, I think one of them actually had, had zero, zero kills in the Battle of Britain, and, and he was one of the top three or top five German aces uh, and had 200 so, or some crazy number of kills um, uh, outside of Battle of Britain, mostly on the Eastern Front. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, it, it's the, the early planes uh, uh, that Russia had were, or Soviet Union had were, were not very good, and so you could really sh take them out uh, um, very easily. Uh, as as the war progressed, the, the Soviet planes obviously did get much much better, and and uh, and and the Soviets had air superiority at the end. I I tell you that one of the theories I like, and I can't prove it, and I'm not smart enough to to delve into it too deeply, but I love the concept. It's called it's the the idea of the non firer and the idea that there are most most of the people in war don't even fire their weapons, and the the damage is done inordinately by the people who do. And the specific examples that the author that I was reading gave, where he said it was most pronounced, was in the air war among fighter pilots, and he was talking about aces. And he said that the aces, he said most people would get up in the air and fly around and never shoot at anybody. But he almost just he almost described the people who were aces as as true killers and they went out there and caused the majority of the damage on both sides um does that does that ring i was trying to figure out because you know we're talking so much about engineering and designs and those kinds of things which seems to take out the human element i grew up next door to a fighter pilot and and he designed he was trying to design an aircraft anyway uh, his whole life in the 1970s after he retired uh, from lockheed but he would talk to me so much about pilot 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 uh -huh. skill skill sure. skill training sure. training training how how does one, I mean, would you rather be the better pilot in the worst plane or the worst pilot in the better plane? Um, I mean, to be totally frank, the I would say the worst pilot in the better plane. The, well, just bear in mind, also, worst plane means this thing might fall out of the sky for reasons. Yes, how much worse? How much fire. worse? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Biplane versus, uh, <laughs> versus jet fighter. Especially yes. Especially over the Pacific. I mean, you're t I mean, the Pacific is very big, and you're flying a long range mission in the Pacific, and, you, and you, your plane is in some trouble. So, I mean, they're probably never going to see you again. So, no, this was your P thirty eight extra to, engine um, argument like, right there. If I was in the Pacific, I'm definitely pleased the P thirty eight. That would be my favorite by far, um, just because at least this, uh, the probability of coming back alive from engine trouble is super is is way better. Um, uh, and the, the P thirty, I, I would have, you know, I, I think, um, you know, obviously this is like some serious armchair armchair quarterback here, but the the, the I would have taken the P thirty eight. And I, and actually, doubled down on that one. Like I said, given it the turbo supercharged Merlins, but d double the power of that plane, double it, and improve the fuel the, the fuel efficiency and allow it to fly super high. There was some improvements needed to the airframe as well uh, to make it uh, more, more maneuverable. It had some some issues, um, I think, in, in dives and rolls. But you, it's, it's easy to, you, to upgrade the the uh, control surfaces. No, not that, not that hard. And, 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 didn't and then, they and do then, some of that uh, with the P sixty one though? Armored, uh, I mean, didn't they do sorry? some of that? Didn't they do some of that with the the P sixty one Black Widow? I mean, wasn't that sort of a a, a super P thirty eight? Yeah, but I think that didn't get. It was late. But yeah, that's that, that's the kind of that 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 basically just a major uprev of the the P thirty eight. I think would have been the the yeah Black Widow is basically like that. Uh, Do you yeah. think it was, wasn't it, or I think it might've had uh, radial air cooled. So kind of a different, kind of a different thing, but yeah, the double boom with the double engine. And I don't know anything about the supercharger or any of its power or any of those kind of things. I know they used it for a night fighter, I think. Yeah. I think there's another element here, which might be interesting, which is, uh, it's the pilots obviously I have a lot of respect for the pilots. My great uncle Bill Overstreet was a, with the 357th right. fighter group flying Mustangs and had a lot of great stories but it's also interesting to look at the engineers and like 
the you know the Mustang was designed by a, a German immigrant to the U.S. Imagine if he'd been over there working on German designs. And so you like the P thirty eight was, I think Kelly Johnson had a role yeah. in it, who went on to do the SRS. You know yeah, later the skunk works. Of, skunk yeah. works. So it's also interesting to look at the folks driving the engineering design and the the you know, the rate of innovation, like you were talking about, and like the the higher the higher innovation rates are those driven by a few key folks. I, I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to look at. You know what? But, Bill, you bring up something now, and maybe it's the obvious jumping off point from what we were just talking about, where you and I are admiring the skill of the pilot so much. I feel like we're entering the era of the pilotless plane. Yeah, I mean, I was absolutely. I was doing some heavy duty research trying to understand the impact of the drone warfare happening over the Nagorno Karabakh area of our, the Armenian Azerbaijani uh, conflict that happened recently. And it seems it seems the logical next step. And you know, Elon, you and I have talked about how the first World War was so so particularly deadly because you had all those years of development, but without practical testing to see how major powers' new equipment would all work. And then you you know you want to at least on each other. I feel like the drones over Armenia are the same kind of thing where we haven't had a major war between major powers where both sides are using cutting edge drone technology. And then we get into that dynamic we've talked about, right? The continually upgrading, you know, the variant G, variant H. Very, um, what do you think about the future of the whole drone warfare um, when it comes to, and maybe not just aircraft, but I mean, one could make a case that they're working on it for armored vehicles on land too. And ships. Yeah, I mean, the, the I mean, it's an interesting future. Um, th there's no question, like, if, if you wanted to have a more effective fighter, bomber, tank, whatever the case may be, the best thing to do is take the pilot out of it at this point. Um, We're already there, you think? Yeah. Um, you'd, you'd rather have a computer doing it than a human being in there at this point already. So Bobby yes. Fisher's losing to the computer already in the chess game. We're losing, you know, you'd write, okay, that's it. But see, to me right there, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like, I just want to separate this out. It's not like I, I want the computers, to, to the drones to take over. But if you say like, if, if you have a, a well-designed unmanned fighter or something like that, and uh, with, with, with you no know, basic AI, we're talking tr primitive AI, it's, it's really going to crush the best human. It can go through super high G turns. It can do things a human can't do um, and not black out. You know, it can do a 10 G, like whatever the fuselage can handle, it, it can handle. And it, it, it has simultaneous awareness and processing of all the sensors. You know, like a guided missile is in some ways like like that. You know, what, what is a guided missile? It's sort of the computer, it's, it's a computer controlled, basically kamikaze plane. So... You're you saying know, if you take the meat computer out of the cockpit, <laughs> the performance of the mechanical systems left over are so superior. Yeah. I mean, so much of, of the plane is oriented towards keeping the pilot alive and allowing the plane, pilot to interact with the, the plane's computer systems. And one fighter jets, it's fly-by-wire. So it's, it's really, you're, you're just telling the computer what to do. But the, the, that plane would get dramatically lighter, cheaper, faster, Pretty much better in every way if it did not have a pilot in it. And I, and I want to emphasize: I like flying planes, and I, I'm a, I'm a pilot personally. So this is not like, you know, this is not some anti-pilot thing. It's just that this isn't the M5 computer on Star Trek, and you're you're replacing Captain Kirk and everything. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that works out well. You want to have these. You want to have like the you know uh, fire control, you know, so-called kill decision still require a human. I think. You know, we don't want, we don't want the computers just we, we don't want Terminator here. You know, so but but I think the reality is like if you if you've got a, a, a tank without humans or a fighter without humans, it's going to win because it, it's going to have it, it it doesn't have to go to all the trouble of trying to keep the the humans who are quite delicate and 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 uh, easily killed alive. It's very difficult to do that. Um, yeah. I'm curious what you might think, you know, you and I have talked about this also, the idea of, um, of, of people trying to deal with technology or integrate or come up with systems and approaches for technology in circumstances where there's no way to train for it before the circumstance breaks out. So uh, I had a conversation with a guy who's a First World War historian, and he's a big fan of General Douglas Haig, who gets called uh, a butcher by some people. But the, but the argument for the anti-butcher crowd is that 
he was in a situation where there's there he's he's in a learning curve, right? He's a cavalry commander from the late 19th century trying to figure out how to integrate aircraft with armored battleships, with tanks on the field, and all these kinds of things that are that are far beyond the world he grew up in. And this goes back to what we were talking about about how quickly the pace of change began to speed up. How do you think the generals and and by the way, they're they're a very interesting group, our modern day generals, in terms of continual learning and all that sort of stuff. How do you think they're going to do? with all the new crap that's been developed since the Second World War when the last time major superpowers faced off. How do you think they're going to do integrating all these new systems against another power that also possesses all these new uh, systems? When both sides have drones, when both sides have computers, when both sides have uh, the Gulf War technology that we were using. Yeah, so so there's an interesting thing that happened. So when, when we... Honestly, once we developed nukes, like wars between superpowers became a decision to destroy humanity or not, or destroy civilization. You'd get some pushback on that from some military leaders. You would. No, but I mean, it's it's just like the stakes are very high. Like you can't just go around using nukes uh, without getting getting nuked yourself, basically. So so, so like in wars between superpowers, like serious wars, or we're not going to happen because the, it, it's, it would just be mutually assured destruction. Uh, at least there was a very there's a too much risk of, of such a thing to uh, have a superpower war. However, drones now move that completely in the other direction. Now you can have a drone war where very few people died or maybe no one dies in, in a drone war. And whoever's drones are successful, they, they won the battle. And, and this may actually reduce the, the risk of, of a war. Or, sorry, reduce, reduce, the risk of, reduce the penalty of a war and increase the risk of having a war. Because it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it ends up being battle bots, you know, and, and so that could be one of the things that happens is that it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's now, it's now, now the stakes have gone super high with nukes to actually n- not even having human casualties could result in potentially more wars down the road. But wars with war- Yeah, I do. I think it opens yeah, up the door. Yeah. Yes. So let me ask you then, because something happened this last couple of weeks uh, in space, you, uh, um, and it had, and you're gonna have to correct me on this, uh, but it had to do with uh, uh, the, the 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 Russians. I always want to call them the Soviets. This is how old I am now. Uh, it's the it's the Russians shooting, I believe, a missile into space and blowing up something and affecting satellites. And all I could think about when I was reading it was this is the this is going to be looked back in the history books as the very early stages of the first. Um, I don't even know what you would call it. Uh, we called it the, the peaceful version of it a space race. I don't know what you call this, but but I'd be interested in your take on uh, what this means and I mean, um, and what a space war would look like and if something like that is a near future or long future thing. I mean, can you give us a little insight from, I mean, you're dealing with this every day. What was your reaction to that um, that incident? Well, we were certainly surprised to see that happen. I think a lot of people in Russia were surprised to see it happen. By the sounds of it, it was, it was something that was, just on the military side and Russian civil space wasn't even aware of it. So, um, I, I, I do, you know, think that is, uh, that was, that was not, not, not great for Russia to do that. But not, not great. great. <laughs> not great. <laughs> Suboptimal. So, Cause it, 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 there's now a bunch of debris that's going to take a, a while to deal with it. And some of that debris potentially puts the space station in trouble, which has Russians on it. So I think that, uh, that was a regrettable incident, but you know, it's clearly, you know, at least, uh, Russia, China, and the U S have demonstrated anti-satellite weapons. The, the U S actually has extremely good anti-satellite weapons. A demonstration that was done a few years ago, actually was a, a U.S. the U S deorbited a satellite. And while the satellite was deorbiting, it was coming back into the atmosphere, fired an anti-satellite missile at the satellite and, and went and hit the fuel tank of the satellite while it was deorbiting. You know, this is sort of like the, you know, Western equivalent of like flipping the, the, the silver dollar in the air, taking out the six gun and going, bam, shooting the, the, the dollar, a hole through the dollar. <laughs> so that was cool. Um, but, but that was like a satellite was, that was deorbiting, so it didn't co- it cause orbital debris. Um, yeah, and this, this is all public information, so you can look at it on, on the internet. 
So there's also direct directed energy weapons, which are based on lasers and microwave lasers, masers. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it basically, so is it's that the first like thing a, that happens, uh, Elon, in the next war? Gone. Is the first thing that the satellites get blinded and knocked out? I mean, is that if if you're if you're war gaming the next major superpower war, and this goes back to what you and I were saying earlier in this conversation about how you how you compensate for uh, an opponent that's technologically superior to you. I mean, if 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 we're the superior higher ground uh, satellite country and someone else can knock out our satellites, is that a great equalizer? Um, is that the first step in the next? In World War Three, is the knocking out of the satellites? Man, true World War Three. I sure hope we never have one of those. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a pessimist on human nature, and I just think that I think that that it's just what was the old line that uh, Bertrand Russell said, right? Expecting a man to walk a tightrope forever. I mean, uh, the odds seem against it to me. I agree that, given enough time, the probability of the, the probability of a third world war is is high if you just give it enough time. Does yeah. To extend the birth, like how fast, how far could you walk on that type rope before falling off? Not forever. No, but I think the logical thing would be to push it too. I think you'd have a miscalculation where it's the old line about where um during the early phases of the nuclear era where they were talking about what if some country pushes, pushes, pushes in little teeny chunks so that it's never enough so you'd want to risk a nuclear exchange over, but it's enough to change the map. Um, I mean, I feel like something like that's a, cl- a classic human First World War type miscalculation rather than people sitting down calculating the odds of winning a Third World War. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess that's that. That is how these things tend to happen. That's a very unsatisfying answer to be right on that. I just want you to know. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> very unsatisfying for the pessimist for you to work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. That's it. I hope I'm wrong. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, um, I think that, uh, certainly one of the things that would occur in uh, any kind of significant third world war, even non-nuclear, would be to uh, take out the space assets of the of, of the others and this can be done with either kinetic uh, weapons like a you know missile of some kind or like an emp an emp is uh man uh you you can love a nuke into the uh upper atmosphere or above the atmosphere uh, in a space and basically just fire it and it actually would cause no or, or no, no it wouldn't it would not cause uh anyone to die on the ground from the from the explosion itself but it would it would uh, the electromagnetic pulse would probably take out any satellites in the vicinity and possibly uh, power grids on the ground. So that that's uh, but, but that's also that man that is a big move to do that stuff. It, also, EMPs do not discriminate, so uh, it, it, you know right. it's going to take out the, all, all the satellites in that area, not just uh, you know the enemy satellites. So I don't know if they'd be going for the EMP, but I think the more likely situation would be anti-satellite missiles uh, or ground-based directed energy. Uh, you know, la- laser is light amplification through stimulated emission radiation. So specifically in the, you know, uh, maybe 400 to 1500 nanometer range with, with a, that, that 1500 nanometer being an infrared laser, uh, which is just sort of heat, heated up essentially. Although those don't, don't work too well if there's a, if the things are cloudy, you end up heating the cloud instead of the you know what you're aiming at. And you know when are, I hear you talk about that though, Elon, I think about because I think you're probably right in terms of of, of of EMPs don't discriminate and all those kinds of stuff, which would seem to indicate that it would not be a smart move for a for us a, a nation state. Uh, how far? Because I realize there's capabilities involved here. How far away are we from having terrorists have a capability like that? Well, if terrorists can launch a nuke into the upper atmosphere, that they they could also nuke whatever else that they, they you know cities or whatever you know. So, but would one nuke hitting? I, I don't get me wrong. I love I love these conversations where we give terrorists ideas, but I feel yeah, like we exactly. have all the ideas. But I mean, but I mean, would you rather would you rather have a, a nuclear weapon if you're a terrorist hit an American city, or would you do more damage to knock out the satellites? And I don't know which is the right answer, but maybe you could. I mean, would we be more discomforted by the satellites going out than uh, than the U.S.? I mean, because if you're in New Orleans, you don't. I mean, Los Angeles being hit's a disaster, but it doesn't affect New Orleans that much. Whereas you take out the satellites lights and we're all in trouble i mean have i got that wrong uh, no i think we'd much rather they took out the satellites than, than, a, than a city and the, 
I think that far. makes sense. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm going to go that that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yes. for sure. Um, Bill, have we left you out of this discussion? Has there been anything we've talked about that that prompts any thinking from you where where either we're I'm totally way off base or we're missing something really intriguing here in the last bit of conversation? I think I just like to look at it back through the lens of the rock, paper, scissors, and there's a lot of new yeah. rocks, papers, and scissors out there. And it's <laughs> yes. just like it's just a treadmill development. The, 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 the rock, paper, scissors treadmill. <laughs> yep. The rock, paper, scissors treadmill. <laughs> Um, what, so, so maybe, maybe let's let's take it a little farther back, Elon, because you know, you and I were talking about engineers yeah. a while back, and you 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 were, you were teaching me about what an engineer does and all these kinds of things, and I started to go back to, you know, we were talking about the importance of engineering as the pace of change speeds up, yeah. but then I keep thinking about guys like Archimedes. Or even earlier, I mean, the stuff in prehistory, once upon a time, somebody invented a bow and arrow or somebody took a bow and turned it into a compound yeah. bow or a composite bow. These people lost it. So talk to me a little about engineering and warfare. Is this just a facet of what engineers do to our whole life? Or is there something very specific to warfare and, and the development of engineering in your mind? Yeah. And, and, and to be clear, I, I don't mean to... Um... Uh, in any way, downplay the value of generalship, uh, you know, tactics, strategy, uh, and like no, they're all know, integrated, individual absolutely. valor uh, or, or anything like that. I just think that um, engineering in general is un underrated in its impact on the outcome of wars. So it's 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 uh, you know to be clear, uh, it's it's just I'm just trying to adjust for the importance of technology uh, in in uh, in warfare that that is often overlooked. Uh, as as an important factor, if, for example, Sun Tzu, Art of War. There is no chapter on technology. I mean, that's that's an interesting book. I read that. I've read that many times, and uh, but the, and you know, lots of interesting elements to it. A lot of wisdom there. But uh, I don't think Clausewitz deals with it either. Now, yeah, that I no, think exactly. About it. It, it, typically, it, it, it's on, Clausewitz on War. It really is alludes to it, but does not really. Uh, uh, there should be a chapter saying if you have a decisive technology advantage, you you can you can actually win with minimal casualties, to your side, <laughs> at least. And uh, you mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation. Uh, I think there's the, 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 the war with Prussia against Austria. They had fast loading guns, and and Austria did not. That was a, made a big big difference in the in the. Was that the needle gun? It was. Uh, I forget. No, this is like. No, thirty years. A precursor ago. to the needle gun. It's, it's something. It was, it was like thirty years ago. Essentially, that the, the the firing rate for, uh, for that, that that Prussia had against the war with Austria was dramatically higher. Right. And so the effectiveness of uh, of the troops is really it, like in one video game. You'd, you'd say for any given weapon, what is the damage per second? DPS. <laughs> Just boil it down to DPS. And um, and in the. Uh, uh, Napoleonic Wars, uh, for example, the uh, British had rifles. You know, a, a rifle is just basically scoring the inside of the barrel to, to, to rotate the, um, the bullet. Yes, that's that, what the rifling is, right? Yeah, that's what, right, rifling is, is basically just you, 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 you put a, a, a you, you, you score the inside of the barrel with, with a rotation to, to put spin uh, into in the bullet. And sorry, I've got a little X here. Uh, so it might have like little baby sounds. <laughs> Um, that's okay. That's I like that <laughs> before comedic relief. So uh, anyway, so so the British had rifles in the Napoleonic Wars, especially towards the end. They had, I, I think, it, it, you know, it, and and it's it's a situation where it sounds like the rifles weren't enough to really make a difference, but actually they they did uh, because they, they, I think they had uh, maybe a couple hundred meters extra range, and the the British would would snipe the the, the for the French officers and the artillery pieces and actually. the artillery pieces exactly so so you don't actually need a lot of they're basically early day sniper rifles right and and they were they were given to units that were like sniper units because your average soldier carried the the unrifled musket but you're right the specialist units carried the and we did that in this country too but if I recall correct me if I'm wrong you almost had to like hammer the bullet down the barrel. I mean, there was a long reload process in a day when it was already a long reload process. Yeah, the, the rifle had, I, I think um, it, it was a while before the rifle reload time was 
was was faster than the, than the, the basic musket ball reload time. But I think that's the war you just talked about, the Austrian Prussian one, right? I mean, that's that's I think that's what part of it was it bolt action. Something was going on there that allowed yeah, the, I, um, the rate of the, the rate of reloading to go fast. Yeah, exactly. This is literally loading. 30 years ago that I read about it. <laughs> um, but but it was it was it was a decisive element because it just meant the damage per second or damage per minute of the the Prussian forces was much higher than the damage per minute of the Austrian forces. You could also lie down where because then you didn't have to stand straight up for reloading, which meant you got away from the the linear warfare of the Napoleonic Revolutionary War era and all that. Yeah, I mean the whole idea of, the whole idea Disper- of dispersion starts and, and just firing musket balls at each other seems insane to me. <laughs> this is like like the death lottery. <laughs> and and with a high chance of winning. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Don't fire till you see the whites <laughs> yeah. of their eyes, right? Like, but, but anyway, I just say like, like there's just examples of like the the British use of rifles in and towards the end of Napoleonic Wars was much more decisive than it would seem based on the sheer number of rifles because they uh, um they, they specifically aimed at the uh, French uh, officers and at the artillery. And so that's like that's like giving you know if, if you lose your officer you don't know what to do. <laughs> but I think and correct like me if I think that head. rifles it's, it's, it's the equivalent of a headshot. You know I don't think anyone had a, a monopoly on rifles. I mean I think that's how Lord Nelson, the famous admiral, was shot. Wasn't he? he was shot by a well that might not have been a rifle. He was shot by a French guy in the uh, in the rigging of a of an enemy ship. But yeah. but you're right. That's the taking out of the officers. If you could kill one Lord Horatio Nelson, how many average sailors is that worth? Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, I think Wellington's underrated. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, as an as an Irish guy, I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> Um, okay, well, well, listen, is, is there anything, because, you know, you and I have been talking about doing this for a long time. Is there anything we didn't talk about that was part of what you wanted to get into here? And this includes you, too, Bill. I don't know what, what you wanted to get into, but I want to make sure that during the course of the conversation, we touch upon these things. I mean, there's so much I could still ask you about. I mean, I wrote down chemical warheads on V2 rockets. <laughs> Did I lose you guys? You still I'm here, there? Bill. Are you there? No, I'm here. I'm just. Okay. Yeah, no, there was no. You, you, are you guys objecting to the fact that there was no actual question in that <laughs> question? Well, I was wondering you guys if we thought you were going to get answered. questions. I didn't know if we actually addressed the last topic change, Dan, or if we kind of hopped around. But um, well, well, hop back. Well, I don't, I don't know exactly where we were headed on it, but it was kind of interesting. Like the idea. I mean, I think Elon was basically saying it's it's not it's all these different aspects and the it's, it's the and the generals and the bravery, but the engineering, it's an interesting lens to look at it through and talk about it. That, that's kind of what I was thinking back to. Well, I mean, so so maybe one could make the case that we've seen the the ratio of importance of all those various elements, generalship, heroism, uh, engineering. So we've seen the ratio and the importance in the terms of a triage level maybe changing over time. Maybe this gets us into a nice bow tie with the beginning of the conversation about the importance of science and engineering once you reach the late 19th, early 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it just when the rate of change of technology is high, such that there is a big technology difference between one side and the other, the, then then technology uh, dominates, uh, and that, and you you get a lopsided victory. So, but then what happens in Afghanistan? You oh, see what uh, I'm saying? I mean, well, I, I think that, that what, what, what you're saying makes sense most of the time, but there are enough e- examples we can use that just say, otherwise it would be why even fight the war, right? It's a foregone conclusion. How come it didn't win in Vietnam? There's other elements, right? Well, the, the, the U.S. Um, uh, is, does, does not engage in, 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 in uh, unrestricted warfare. So, uh, you know, I, I, by no means do I mean suggest that the, the – that, that everything America does is 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 good, but um, and I'll, I'll probably get a lot of flack for saying this, but uh, probably a lot. But I, I actually think America is the, the the greatest sort of force for benevolent outcome of any country in history. <laughs> On balance, that doesn't mean everything America does is good. You know, so you could always say like America went to the moon. Why can't they do? Why can't America do everything? That <laughs> it's like look. You know, America is like a person. Person, you know, might do something brilliant, but it doesn't mean everything they do is brilliant. So, but because 
you know, yeah, you know, here in America, we we aspire to be the good guys, and may that ever continue. And uh, uh, it, if 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 the if, if if the warfare is truly allowed to be unrestricted, you can just carpet bomb the enemy until they're not there anymore. I mean, we could use nukes. But let's not but let's not pretend that that's a moral question. Always, I mean, the reason you don't nuke North Vietnam is because then you're going to risk the full-on nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. I mean, in other words, you might have wanted to turn North Vietnamese uh, territory into glass, but it might not have been an option on the table, right? There's multiple There's multiple factors going into all these decisions that, that, that constrain your options, right? Yeah, but you, 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 nukes would not have been required to defeat uh, the Viet Cong. You, that could have been done with conventional weapons, but it would have resulted in a lot of civilian sign so then the question is uh, like are you willing to kill large numbers of civilians the united states is not willing to do that so therefore loss hmm. i'm thinking of korea and i think we destroyed almost all those villages um and ended up in a stalemate i just i think i think there's an interaction going on here and i think that the technology is just one aspect of this but i do believe and i think this is something you've alluded to that as the as the technological sophistication becomes so overwhelming and so dominant that it starts to shrink the importance of all those other factors that we talked about that play into the overall equation right like you said if it's laser beams versus cavemen that's pretty. That's a pretty. That's a pretty decisive situation. Yeah, or, or even yeah. If, if you simply have air superiority, and you do not, you're not don't have the advantage of ex- extreme ground cover in a, in a sort of a, a heavily jungled situation. There's just having air superiority will, will that you're going to win. You know. So, but it depends on what win means too. Right? Depends on what what win, win means. But yeah, I mean, certainly no question the United States could have won the war in Viet, Vietnam. If 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 it, if it had the will to do so, and and was willing to be uh, t- do a lot more civilian casualties, but I, I mean I think that that would not be a good thing. But uh, you know the United States just just doesn't believe in you know the United States cares about if if, lo- if lots of civilians die, the, you know, and this is actually relatively unusual uh, in, in in you know it, they're they're. In, in all in all the wars and all the history and all the protagonists, most of them did not care about killing civilians. The United States does, and may it ever be that way. Now you've got my brain. So you got this is what I like about these conversations is you've got the wheels turning now. So now you've got me wondering about technology in the Second World War if the other side had developed it first. So we all know the Germans were working hard on jet aircraft. I would say jet fighters or jet bombers, but apparently they couldn't make up their minds. Um, so let's talk about then nuclear weapons. We know that they, uh, you know, there's some rumors of the Japanese working on them, but we know that the Germans would have liked to have gotten them. Um, so if they had gotten them first. First, realizing that you know there were not many bombs even when we had them, um, how much of a difference does that make? If if in forty four, I don't want to say forty five because I think the war is over already. But but let's imagine during a time period where there's still something going on, um, how decisive is something like that if the Germans get the nuclear, uh, the atomic weapons first? In your mind, they win, of course. Do you think so? Yes. Hmm. I wonder because uh, they got the V two rockets, right? I mean, no, no, uh, but the damage potential. I, I mean. Put it this way: If they have both um, long-range rockets, the V2s and the and the yeah, it's game, instant, instant. The other side just lost. Hundred percent. Hmm, interesting. I I still wonder why they didn't. I mean, look, when you realize that that regime was was so terrible that that nothing is beyond the the pale of what they might do. I don't know why in forty four they didn't just say we have all this territory we're occupying. Uh, if if you don't want something really bad to happen to all these occupied people, you know, you'll come to the negotiating table right now. I mean, I always wonder why things didn't. If if a science fiction writer were having some fun with that, they'd be holding you know whole countries hostage for a good deal. Uh, and maybe maybe that dovetails into something you said earlier, but you really think it's game over if the Germans get new, is there a time period where they could get nuclear weapons where it's too late? I mean, if they get them in, in January 45, is it too late or is it such a game changer? It doesn't matter when they get them. Uh, well, if they've lost air superiority, then I think it would be tough. Um, well, they lost that in 43 probably, don't you think? Not fully. No, they, uh, 
you know, they, they, they didn't have it over, over Britain or whatever, but they, they, I don't think they lost their superiority in 43 over Germany or in that area. It basically, okay. it's like, it's like you, you, you need a delivery Contested. vehicle. Uh, and that's either got to be a long range right, bomber right. or a long range missile. So, but, you know, it, it's, you know, <laughs> it, clearly they wouldn't have bothered using troops on Stalingrad if they had a nuke. They'd be like, oh, that used to be a city, not anymore. So, okay. Well, now I want to now I want to ask a question that might be a good time to wrap this up because it might be a good good. So I've always it's always been my contention that the Germans um, of the First World War were a stronger power and a more formidable foe than the Germans of the Second World War. And one of the reasons I always used was that the Germans in the Second World War deliberately got rid of a lot of the things that would have helped them in the Second World War for reasons that had nothing to do with military superiority at all. So, for example, uh, a lot of Jewish people fought uh, patriotically for Germany in the First World War. Uh, A lot of those same Jewish people that would have done it in the Second World War were in other countries by the time the Second World War was fought because they weren't welcome at home, and that's saying it mildly. But you take a guy like Einstein, and we know there were were several besides Einstein, who would have been involved in um, assuming that they were patriotic Germans fighting for the German cause, as they would have in the First World War. Um, A guy like Einstein and, and his compatriots might have been helping the Germans develop uh, atomic weapons. How much of a difference do you think it might have made had the had the people that were in the U.S. atomic weapons program or the U.S. space program or anything like that, if they'd stayed in Germany and had fought and 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 used their uh, scientific skills for that side as opposed to our side? How much of a difference does that make in your mind? No, I think that would have made a tremendous difference. And the person you'd want is not Einstein, but Leo Szilard. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, Szilard was the one who really. Uh, was, was pushing the nukes. And and frankly, I think there were others that kind of knew, there are probably a, a fair number that knew it, it, this would probably work, but they did not want uh, to, to send their mind in that direction. Uh, but Zillard, Zillard, and I believe Zillard was Hungarian. So, yes. so if, 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 you know, they literally had a mind. Yeah, guys like Fuchs, though, Klaus Fuchs was there. I mean, they had people like that, yeah, too, right? Yeah, uh, ex- exactly. <laughs> so, you know, if, 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 if they'd... Uh, gotten um if, if 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 they had in fact uh not been been anti-semitic uh and just generally alienated a lot of people and pushed apart alienated to say the least <laughs> uh, um then then they there's a good chance germany i, I would say germany probably would have had this the, the nuke before anyone else yeah is there anything, Elon, and this applies to you too, Bill, is there anything I didn't get into and that, that's, that's an interesting piece of, of, of information on this subject we've been dealing with that I just either didn't ask you about or was not intelligent enough to even know it was sitting out there in plain sight? Um, I always hate to just leave anything on the table. So, so what haven't we dealt with that would have been intriguing? Well, I mean, we could certainly talk for, for a long time, and, and I'd be open to talking again in the future if you'd like. Um, but, uh, man, there's so much we could talk about. Uh, well, you know what? You can save it for next time. Then this this gives us a wonderful jumping off point next time, and I hope Bill would be nice enough to join us as well. Sure, I mean, we, we could we could drill maybe more into you know more specifics about particular battles and that kind of thing. Well, we could we could maybe get into some of the things you guys wanted to talk about instead of my pet issues, also. Uh, yeah, no, I mean we're we're just basically trying to emphasize that um, you know in in, uh, in some conflicts, technology and, and engineering these were, were kind of engineering wars. And um, and that that uh, is often overlooked, uh, as you mentioned, not not in Sun Tzu, not in Clausewitz on war, and um, but but obviously uh, extremely decisive if you have um, you know a, a big technology advantage. Maybe that's the fun part to jump off next time. I'll do some research and try to find out when you first start seeing discussions of technology advantages and whatnot in the in the written historical record. That might be fascinating. Well, there's that isn't that poem? Um, what, what, what 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 I forget the exact terminology. What what all, what all, whatever else matters. We have the Maxim gun. And We've they got do the not. Maxim gun, and they have not. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, it's funny because there's um there was some stuff written, and I'd have to look it up. I remember reading it in Arthur Farrell's book um, on warfare, where he was talking about as the Roman Empire is starting to decline, they were starting to push some ideas, or some people, their versions of Elon Musk, were starting to push ideas of secret weapons and super weapons and ways that they could somehow compensate for the other areas in warfare that they were losing, whether it's territory where they could 
recruit soldiers from or or what have you. And it was stuff like, you know, scythe chariots and all kinds of interesting. We all know that they had Greek fire and a bunch of other interesting things. Be fun to look at um, the impact of technology in earlier warfare before we could even really recognize it as technology. Yeah, to- totally. In, in my opinion, the, the, the Romans won their wars for, for many reasons, but one of the this decisive elements was the Romans uh, were, were the best engineers. Absolutely. It's like Assyrians were great engineers, too. Yeah. Um, I know, I know and the less, Chinese, always. I know less about that, but, but the, the Romans really were great engineers. And, uh, I mean, they'd lay down roads. And if, like, you're trying to march somewhere, man, roads, are, roads beat the heck out of some, you know, little windy path through the forest. Um, and, uh, you know... It's totally the non-sexy side yeah. of war, too, but it's so you important. You seriously need roads. Um, yeah, I mean, it, and, it was kind of a theme, the, the supply chain, like the the octane, high-octane fuel, yeah. the roads gets the legions where you need them to fight the Celts. The supply, you know, like, didn't um, Napoleon say an army marches on its stomach? Right, right. <laughs> which, which I think may, maybe actually falsely attributed to Napoleon, but... Oh, okay. Sorry. But, but, it, but, it, but it's nonetheless true. <laughs> I have found that it, I, I, it's dangerous for me to quote anybody anymore because everybody I've ever quoted and every quote I've ever I've ever repeated seems to be wrong when people double check it. So apparently nobody ever said anything that's attributed <laughs> to them in history. That's all I can figure. It's, it's, it's true. I, <laughs> I, I, I end up digging deep into the etymology of things for whatever reason. <laughs> As, as as Claire knows, I, I I literally bought etymology.com. Um, you did not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I actually know a lot about. At first, I judged you for buying that, but then I realized you actually really do care about etymology. I really do care about etymology. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, listen, I guess this means we have another show coming eventually whenever, you know, uh, with your spare time and your schedule, it'll be in about 25 years, but we'll be right on uh, Great, that. We, we can go into the etymology of things like bolts to the wall, because that, that's the... Oh, that's actually super interesting. Just say, <laughs> no, but just say that one. Just say that one. It's so one. interesting. No, it's the, so the interesting. bolts to the wall. The okay. <laughs> it's, it is cool. <laughs> okay, go. That's a perfect thing to end on. What is the etymology of balls to okay, the wall? well... Um, th- these days it may be confusing when you hear balls to the wall because presumably you're not suggesting that someone, if they're, if they're you know, have balls, uh, put them on the wall because <laughs> why would you ever want to put your balls on a wall? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but uh, and, and so the etymology of this goes back to, to, to many different things. Certainly um, in uh, World War II, for example, balls to the wall would be, if it would be max throttle. So the, the, the tips of the... Um, of the, the the throttle lever would be balls, <laughs> and so balls to the wall would be max throttle. Um, however, there's something that arguably predates that, uh, which, which is um, a, a, um, the the way you would control a steam engine was by having a, uh, two balls spinning um, on a cable or a rod, or, 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 or I think cable, and and then depending upon. Um, how um, much throttle you you wanted? You would you would uh, either crank the, the balls in or crank them or crank them out. Um, and so, if you crank them out, balls to the wall would be would again mean a full throttle for the steam engine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we didn't there's, start there's with that, man. This whole, the, uh, the whole balls to the wall situation. I can't even even like deeper into balls to the wall. I, yeah. Anyway, uh, I I sense an entirely new topic taking over. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, listen, man, I, I've really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed having all three of you on, and let's do this again soon, okay? Yeah, actually, one final etymology. Uh, when, you yes. say, when you say to someone, give it the whole nine yards, do you know what that means? I don't. Okay, well, this is, again, a, a de- debatable etymology, but the the one of the possible uh, uh, origins is the length of an ammo belt in, in, in World War II was uh, on the order of nine yards. So giving it the whole nine yards means just <laughs> emptying the entire ammo belt on it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. You know what you, you, know what you may be, you know what you okay. may be thinking? <laughs> um, 
Uh, I'll tell you what you made me think of, and it's the craziest thing to have have, co- have come from what you just said, but I got a tour once of the Westminster School, which is attached to Westminster Abbey uh, in London, and it's been around since forever. I mean, like the Middle Ages, practically. So they're giving me the tour. The students are giving me the tour, and between classes they have, it's not a handball court, but it's a place where they kind of play something like handball, and it's in a, in a specific area that just is, you know, where there's walls to bounce stuff off of and everything, and the guy says to me, we have all these house rules, like if the ball goes over there it's two points if the ball goes over there it's out of bounds and i said oh i said well when did they make these rules he said in the middle ages he said so so all of the little house rules that they still played with and you said balls to the wall that's what it was it was a ball on the wall and all i could think of was here are a bunch of students today who have no idea really of history or anything like that and yet they're playing a game where the house rules that they still play under were invented centuries ago i just thought that was hilarious yes. so i could go on um, and on about uh, word or the etymology. No, no, we're not. No, literally, no. No, que sera, sera. Que sera, sera is not Spanish. <laughs> it's it's English. Like, we just, it's English stolen from Latin <laughs> about five hundred years ago. Like, there's a, this is like a Wikipedia hole for and, like and it, and it means nothing hours. like the Latin Latin phrase. Do we want to know what it means, or is this something you'd better leave the audience hanging with? Well, case sera, sera is like whatever will be will be. Um, is uh but it, it's it's actually technically an english phrase because it's it, it was bastardized from latin uh, but the phrase in latin doesn't mean the same thing and um but a lot of people think it's, Sp- it's spanish or italian or something like that but it's it's actually an english <laughs> english phrase uh and it's been used for like 500 years um and it actually it, it means it basically implies uh a, a cheery fatalism My thanks to Elon Musk and Bill Riley from SpaceX for coming on the program today. And, you know, it was funny as I was listening to that during editing, it reminded me of my concept of hardcore history when it first appeared in my brain before we'd done any work and it had evolved in any way, shape, or form. I'd thought about it as a continuation of the sorts of conversations that we used to have as history geeks when I was a history major in college. And questions like, "Would would you rather be the better pilot in the inferior aircraft or the inferior pilot in the superior aircraft. I mean, that kind of thing. In my head, I thought, okay, this is what we'll do with this hardcore history thing. Now, it didn't obviously go in that direction, um, but this is the kind of thing where I could talk about this all day. This is the the light conversation I like to have, which is my, my sister always says, you're so weird, but, you know, there are worse things, right? Um, speaking of, you know, the strange and perhaps hard to purchase for, for the holidays. Uh, You know, you may have a loved one or family member that you're having a hard time finding uh, a good gift for them because they're interested in the extremes of the human experience and you just can't get that at the local big box store always. Uh, You can get it off our website, though. Um, The old shows that are no longer on the free feed are available from the website. You can. Uh, we have a new system to purchase them too. If you want to use it, called the Glow System, should make it easier for people with certain kinds of podcast players. We have gift certificates for loved ones. We have some new merch with new designs that is just you know dropped uh, t-shirts, hats, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in all that stuff, it's out there. DanCarlin.com. Uh, I won't go into it too deeply, just to say that there are some you know some uh, illnesses and infirmities in the family right now that are are preventing me from getting to the big hardcore history recording, which never goes as quickly as we'd like anyway. So I apologize for the lateness of it all. Not just that, but it's one of those topics that we're trying to be very careful with, a little incendiary in our current um, zeitgeist, for lack of a better word. So um, apologies, patience, please. We'll get to it, and hopefully you think it's worth it when we do. Finally, um, I do want you all to know, and I mean this, I mean, people say things all the time that are just sort of platitudes, Uh, It's been, historically speaking, a hard last two years for us all. I mean, on a global level. Uh, I don't know what the next year holds, but, um, you know, I hope it's better for all of us. And I think here's the thing. You know, history can obviously break any number of different ways, and I'm a little pessimistic usually, so I always assume the worst. But let's not forget that things can turn on a dime in strange directions, and that means directions that are improvements for all of us as well, whatever you might consider improvements to be. Regardless, um, let's remember whatever your beliefs, 
your thoughts, wherever you may live and whatever your circumstances. Believe it or not, as strange as this sounds, as much of a platitude as this sounds, we're all in this together. And I always um, like to think that if you and I, whomever you may be, simply sat down over a cup of coffee or tea or something, um, we could have a good conversation, find commonalities and ways to get along and enjoy each other. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And that's coming from a person who's basically pessimistic. So if you're optimistic, the sky's the limit. Stay safe, everybody. Have a wonderful 2022. And I hope I'm talking to you a lot over the next year. Support us with Patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash Dan Carlin or go to our donate page at dancarlin.com forward slash DC dash donate. You may have heard me talk about Battle Guide Virtual Tours recently. Um, it's, a, it's a group of folk in, um, in Europe who were doing live tours when COVID hit and had to try to figure out, like so many other people, how you reimagine a business for you know, during a time of, of a pandemic. And they came up with something that it's one of those things that you never would have thought about it if you hadn't been forced to because of something like the pandemic. But because you came up with the idea, it's a brilliant idea. And it brings battlefield tours to all sorts of people who couldn't be expected to make it out to all those battlefields in person. And even if you're lucky enough to make it to one or two, um, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go to 20 or 30? Well, maybe you could do that virtually, and now with Battle Guide Virtual Tours, you can. It's one of those things you kind of have to see to get a sense of, but basically they combine satellite and drone imagery, a live historian, um, eyewitness accounts, period footage. I mean, it's all blend, blended together to give you a real sense of a given battle and what's going on and what the challenges are and what it was like on the ground and visually give you a real sense of of what you're seeing. Battles are notoriously difficult sometimes to get a real sense of. This is probably the best way to do it. And if you want to get a sense of what that's like, um, you know, throwing my name around can get you a 50% discount right now. If you go to battleguide.co.uk forward slash Dan hyphen Carlin and, uh, and get a look at it and just see what we're talking about here. Uh, there are two kinds of tours, basically. Uh, the live ones, where if you catch it when it's going on, you can participate. It's a Q&A kind of thing, um, and it's happening you know, while you're watching. But then those things are saved to be accessed later, and you can go watch all the, the previous tours and, and, and access it that way at your convenience also. Lots of different options, including gift certificates for people you know, that might be a little bit difficult to buy gifts for, find something unusual. Maybe they'd like, you know, a gift certificate giving them several battlefield tours. But as I said, why don't you take the 50% offer here and check it out for yourself at battleguide.co.uk forward slash Dan hyphen Carlin and take a, you know, virtual battlefield tour yourself at Battle Guide Virtual Tours.